Good morning. Um, I want to uh, begin by just welcoming everyone back from uh, the break and by thanking Alan Kruger, although Alan is on his way downtown to the New York Times, thanking uh, Alan Kruger um, for his address. We're, um, we're thrilled that he chose uh, Columbia and SEPA and the launch of uh, the Center on Global Economic Governance uh, to offer his thoughts about the state of the American economy and its connection uh, to the global economy. Um, I think what we learned from, uh, from Alan's um, very perceptive and powerful uh, remarks is that uh, the economic problems um, and economic challenges facing the United States are intimately connected with the challenges of global economic governance. And I think we'll see um, some of that connection reflected in, um, in the panel. Um, as Provost uh, Coatsworth um, intimated this morning, uh, earlier in introducing uh, Jan, um, and the center, um, this is the kind of discussion, um, and the kind of mourning, the kind of interaction among policymakers and scholars um, um, that we think can ha happen um, only at a place like Columbia and at a place like SEPA, um, which we like to think of as the world's leading school of what we call global public policy. Um, global public policy recognizes um, that the old distinctions between local and national or national and domestic and international are really fading into insignificance, that there's no such thing anymore as global, as, as national public policy or as local public policy, that the challenges that an economy such as the United States faces are deeply and intimately interconnected with decisions that are taken elsewhere in the world, that things that we do here um, affect things that happen elsewhere in the world and vice versa. And it's to that kind of new thinking and that kind of challenge that both SEPA and our uh, new Center on Global Economic Governance um, are uh, devoted. And I think at SEPA we're building a new kind of policy school uh, for the 21st century that recognizes um, the global nature of these problems and the inadequacy in many respects of uh, old, traditional, more hidebound ways of thinking about these problems and of training students to address these problems. Um, what is global public policy? Um, it begins primarily with a deep devotion to public service and a mission uh, toward diagnosing, thinking carefully and designing solutions for um, the most pressing and urgent problems in the world. It's rooted, as I think was reflected um, in Alan's address this morning, um, in, uh, in, in uh, social science and careful, um, informed policy analysis, and in deep knowledge of critical public policy issues. Um, but it expands those, uh, those frameworks um, to encompass uh, a global orientation. Um, and I think that's what uh, we are seeing reflected here this morning. Um, in the connections that will begin to develop in the next hour or so between Alan's reflections on, um, on the challenges of the American economy and our very distinguished panel um, that's coming up right now uh, that will begin to dissect the European financial crisis um, and its impact and its implications um, for the global economy and for the United States. Um, the focus of our panel today is the European economic crisis, and I'm really pleased um, that we have an extremely distinguished uh, group of panelists drawn almost entirely from the ranks of the SEPA faculty. This is a real moment of pride for Columbia and for the School of International and Public Affairs that our bench is so deep um, that uh, we just had to bring in a one ringer from the, uh, from the media uh, world right here in New York City. Um, to help us augment um, and, uh, you know, pretty up our, uh, our distinguished panel of, of colleagues from Columbia. Um, so I'm very pleased to welcome you all again to the launch of CGEG, which we think is going to be an extraordinarily exciting venture here at SEPA, um, and to bring back to the podium um, Jan Svenner, who will introduce the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Robert. Thank you all for coming back from break. 
Uh, I will just in, I will introduce the panelists first, then I will join them. I'll make a few interactive remarks. Uh, Kathleen Hayes has agreed to moderate, and I will help her in moderating the panels, but be panel, but we will both also be uh, part, part of the panel as panelists. So uh, uh, many of you know, know the panelists. Let me just uh, briefly mention Professor Guillermo Calvo is Professor of Economics, International and Public Affairs. He's also Director of the Program in Economic Policy Management here at Columbia University. Uh, he is Research Associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. He served as the Chief Economist of the Inter-American Development Bank. He was Professor of Economics in a number of other universities, including the University of Pennsylvania and was a distinguished uh, professor, university professor, University of Maryland. He served as senior advisor in the International Monetary Fund and has advised a number of Latin American governments and testified in front of the U.S. Congress. Kathleen Hayes, the ringer as uh, she's been described here, is one of the top economics reporters and anchors in the country. Uh, she has covered the U.S. economy, the Federal Reserve, for more than 20 years on television, uh, in the print, and in electronic media. Kathleen joined Bloomberg uh, Television in January 2006, and she is anchor of On the Economy, uh, the only daily national business program focusing on the economic forces driving the U.S. and global markets. Uh, uh, she is also serves as economics editor, specializing in U.S. economy and Federal Reserve. Uh, Merit Chano, professor in the practice of international economic law and international uh, affairs at Columbia University, SIPA, School of International Public Affairs. She is the director of the program in international finance and economic policy at SIPA and co-director of Columbia's APEC Studies Center. In December 2007, Professor Jano finished up a four-year term as the North American member of the appellate body of the World Trade Organization. And before joining Columbia, she was a Deputy Assistant U.S. Trade Representative for Japan and China at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. Sharon O'Halloran is the George Brumenthal Professor of Political Science and International and Public Affairs at Columbia. Uh, she is uh, served as advisor to the Mexican government, the Department of Commerce in the Mexican government, International Trade Division, and has written extensively in the areas of trade and the environment, trade and labor, and global outsourcing. She has recently advised the Turkish government on the impact of democratization and economic development on political stability. And she has also consulted with the World Bank's International Finance Group and its Regulation and Competition Policy Group on the impact of trade and political institutions on economic growth and performance. Jeffrey Sachs is the director of the Earth Institute, Gatlet Professor of Sustainable Development, and Professor of Health Policy and Management at Columbia's University School of International and Public Affairs. He's also special advisor to the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. And from 2002 to 2006, he was director of the UN Millennium Project and special advisor to United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan on the Millennium Development Goals. So we will now have each of the panelists provide a brief set of introductory remarks to create the mosaic of the issues that we'll be covering then we will have a discussion among the panelists and we'll open it to questions and answers uh, from the floor. So let me in fact start by being a panelist and <laughs> sitting down here and uh, that way we'll launch it. So hopefully I will still carry over. So let me just introduce a little bit the issues um, that we'll be dealing with and we'll have, I'll have three slides just to show you sort of the, depict the main issues. So. Um, First of all, we're dealing with, the, with Europe, and as you can see in dark blue, those are the countries within Europe, within the European Union, that are part of the common currency area, the Eurozone, out of which many people think some of the problems that we'll be talking about are emanating. The rest of them are part of the European Union, but are not uh, sharing the Euro currency. Now, um, if you look at uh, the second slide that I have, we realize that uh, the European Union is the largest economy in the world. So in terms of GDP, uh, Europe accounts for roughly a quarter 
uh, US also accounts roughly for a quarter. And together with the largest and most dynamic uh, uh, economies in the world, uh, the so-called BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, and add into it Japan, we have three quarters of the world GDP. So relatively few players can influence very significantly what's happening in the world. Now, Europe, which we will focus on today and its repercussions on the rest of the world, it usually follows in uh, business cycles and everything else what's happening in uh, the United States, and this was indeed the case during the Great Recession and the financial crisis uh, that Alan Kruger discussed in depth in his uh, presentation. Now, what's happened since uh, late last year, while the US and most of the world has been growing, uh, most of Europe has actually been in a recession. So in that sense, this big chunk of the world economy has been in a recession and the problem has been especially acute among the weaker EU members. Uh, they are called the pigs by some people, meaning Portugal, uh, Ireland, sometimes Italy, uh, Greece and Spain. They prefer to be called the Club Med countries, so take your pick. Uh, and there is a fear of contagion. Uh, the third slide that I just wanted to show you is uh, GDP of Europe and what you can see is the large players like Germany, Britain, France and so on and there is a relatively small player uh, in the northeast quadrant namely Greece which accounts for less than 2% of Europe's um, economy and yet has been at the forefront of attention and fear of destabilizing the entire European economy and Europe then destabilizing the rest of the world, hence the topic of our discussion today. So there's a fear of uh, contagion that might spill from Europe if Europe uh, really takes a deep downturn and uh, for the rest of the world. Now Europe's problems are attributed to various often interrelated factors that will be discussed here this morning. There is the issue of the monetary integration, the Eurozone, which uh, has been undertaken but the argument goes without adequate fiscal coordination or unification. The idea that there have been a number of countries that had weak fiscal policies, that means deep fiscal deficits and in a number of cases high debt, and that this was aggravated by the uh, financial crisis. There is the discussion of the loss of competitiveness of these uh, club med countries uh, where domestic inflation and lack of productivity growth accompanied by lack of restructuring, productive restructuring, uh, maybe bringing about problems which in the past were compensated for by currency depreciation and that's not possible nowadays when there is the common currency. There is a major discussion of the weakness of the banking sector, financial sector in general in Europe, the uh, question of whether the economic model, the social, the so-called social economic European model of how capitalism works, whether that is in fact sustainable in the face of global competition. And there is the question whether the markets, uh, financial markets in particular, are overreacting. Are they just reacting appropriately or are they overreacting to this perceived unsustainability of the fiscal and possibly uh, social policies that will be discussed. <laughs> And uh, obviously the uh, most recent set of issues revolve around uh, whether the austerity that we observe on the part of the government policies in Europe is in some sense excessive in the short run stifling growth which is very much needed to deal with the problems that are here. Now I will just end my introductory remarks by saying it's interesting that until recently the monetary union, the euro, has been considered a real success. In fact when you look at the 10-year uh, celebrations of the introduction of Euro in 2009, there were quite optimistic views. Euro, in fact, quickly became number two reserve currency in the world, and the questions were whether the Euro would, in fact, replace the dollar as the lead main world currency. There is a very nice quote from Alan Greenspan from December 2007 saying it is absolutely conceivable that the euro will replace the dollar as reserve currency or will be traded as an equally important uh, reserve currency. Now at this moment, as you know, there is a big question whether euro will survive or in what kind of form it will survive. Let me turn it over to Kathleen.
you very much. And I want to say what an honor it is to be here. Yes, I am the ringer. Um, I do my show already on Bloomberg Radio now, the Hayes Advantage, and I must say to, I get to usually ask people like this the questions. That's mostly what I'm going to do today, but I will put some questions on the table uh, because that's my perspective. And as a journalist, this European debt crisis and this question of what it's going to do to the global economy and to the global markets, and they're so intertwined, has really been the ongoing big story of the past two years. It's the headlines day in and day out that have tended to move the markets. All the volatility we've seen in the stock market lately, even the, since though it had this you know, great run since October, that has been a big story day in and day out. And like it's funny that so many people now who never thought about you know, Spain's budget or what's going on in the Netherlands are suddenly talking a lot about the politics of all these countries. And of course the question is, for Europe's grand vision, is it just going through some major growing pains? I mean, 10 years isn't that old, or it is, is it on, truly on the verge of blowing apart? Uh, the question, of course, will Europe's debt crisis derail the, derail the global economy? It hasn't so far. The U.S. economy is growing moderately. And in, ironically, that's even helped push U.S. government bond yields lower. And that, of course, is something the Fed's been trying to do, keep mortgage rates down, keep the, the borrowing costs low. So in a funny kind of way, it's probably helped us a bit. It's clearly a big worry for the Federal Reserve. Uh, earlier this month, I was in Atlanta. I did an interview with Dennis Lockhart, who's president of the Atlanta Fed and he is forecasting steady, moderate growth in the U.S. economy. However, he did see two big tail risks. One of them is the Middle East, the possibility of some kind of event that causes an oil price spike, but the other one, and this is what you hear from every Fed official, is the European debt crisis getting worse. Interesting, too, that yesterday the Federal Reserve wrapped up a two-day meeting, and they put out a very terse policy statement after every meeting, and one of the things they did in yesterday's statement as they assessed the economy was they took out a phrase that said, strains in global markets have eased. Ben Bernanke now, three or four times a year, does a press conference at the end of a two-day meeting. And he was asked during this press conference, why did you do that? And he said, well, basically, the statements, it, it, it's a statement of fact. At the last meeting in mid-March, after two rounds of LTRO, the long-term financing by the European Central Bank, the markets had calmed down. Since then, we see uh, concerns about Spanish debt, Italian debt. We're seeing it reflected in the market. Uh, so we can see the concerns, and I think the question is now, and why the Fed is worried, why we're all worried, is, is, is could this get worse? And if it did, what would happen? Well, individual countries could go bankrupt. They could perhaps default on their debt in an unstructured way. Uh, maybe the Eurozone breaks apart even just sheds a couple pieces, but in a disorderly fashion. This could cause financial panic. Remember what we saw when uh, Lehman Brothers was allowed to fail? It could have far-reaching consequences for the global economy. Of course, it doesn't have it happen that way, and that's why we're here to try to hammer this out. As a journalist, this is what I do I ask questions, so let me put a couple on the table. Jan touched on it. I would say the biggest one and the ongoing basic question throughout this two, two and a half years has been austerity versus growth. Can countries cut their way to prosperity? Is austerity a time-proven remedy to get a sick, debt-ridden patient back on its feet with a painful but effective treatment, or is it like bloodletting in the days of old? Too much and you kill the patient. Uh, again, this austerity has been the heart of the European strategy. But there are signs it's not working. If you look at Spain, for example, it set a 4.4% deficit target for this year. Uh, the cuts they're doing help feed into a recession. The economy's contracting. That makes it ever harder to meet the budget deficit target. They've had to revise their target to 5.3%. The IMF says their deficit's going to be 6% this year. It's like they can't, they can't dig out the hole fast enough as the dirt's being thrown in. I mean, that's the wrong metaphor, but there's something like that. And of course, we're seeing austerity backlash now. Um, in France, voters are rejecting this sort of Germanic, you know, Franco alliance, you know, Sarkozy and Merkel, which uh, the markets have uh, called Merkozy, right? Um, they may elect a president who has vowed to rewrite all these agreements. The Dutch government in turmoil, and this was one of the most budget of buying strict countries in the Eurozone. They're re-questioning it. Greece has an election coming in May at a time when the electorate is so splintered it raises questions about how a new coalition gov government will be able to govern. 
Now, it looks like the political shockwaves are not going unnoticed in Germany and by extension at the European Central Bank. A very interesting story, Bloomberg News reported this week, Mario Draghi is calling for a growth compact now, compact. You know, they had the fiscal compact, fiscal union. Now it's talking about a growth compact. How interesting, just when this austerity backlash is starting. The call was quickly uh, echoed by Chancellor Merkel. You're talking about steps to make these countries more competitive along with steps, the structural steps to cut their budget deficit. They want to have them in, uh, in place for the June G20 summit in Mexico. But how far will this really go? Will Germany, so big on austerity, start backing transfer payments? They've been opposed to euro bonds. Will they really shift on this? And speaking of the bond market, this is another big question for Europe. The bond vigilante, vigilantes, you know, the people who watch deficits and all these things, supposed to ride in and, and inflict discipline, they certainly missed the boat in Europe. Let's, let's take a look at my chart now. I just love this chart. It's from a paper written by Chris Waller and Fernando Martin at the St. Louis Fed. It's called The Sovereign Debt Crisis, A Modern Greek Tragedy. It'll be out May 8th. And what you see here are yield spreads between, I don't call them the pigs, Jan. I'm trying to invent a new name for everybody to jump on. It's Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Ireland. So I call them the gypsies. So it's the spread of the gypsies versus Germany, the yields. And you can see how in the early 2000s, the yield spreads had collapsed. Once the euro was launched, and once they got in the union, it looks like bond investors started seeing these sovereign bonds as perfect substitute. You see the blowout in 2009. And of course, it's maybe not surprising that happened. A lot of countries were moving in the right direction. Inflation rates were converging. Uh, even Greece finally got its um, inflation rate down to about 3%. And another very important little detail, the banks, the bank regulators, counted all this sovereign bond debt as tier one capital. So maybe we can't blame the banks for loading up or the bond investors for buying it either. Then of course what happened was 2009, the Greeks elected a new government. They found out that their deficit to GDP ratio wasn't 4%, but 16%. Ireland, in the financial crisis, right, had to take over its bank debt, or that's what it chose to do, some would say unwisely. Its debt to GDP ratio, in went from 25% in 2007 to 100% in 2010. So what happened next? And this is what uh, Waller and Martin point out in their paper. Investors got worried they wouldn't be repaid on their debt. That's when the spreads blew out, and that's when the debt crisis began, because that's what a debt crisis is. You don't know if you're going to get paid back. And once you get that default risk genie out of the bottle, it's very hard to put it back in again. Furthermore, there's not a lot of evidence that the bond market thinks austerity is working. Greece restructured its debt, but there's no appetite to buy their bonds, especially after they rewrote rules and invoked collective action clauses on creditors. In other words, we wrote the rule, we wrote the contract, oh, we're going to rewrite it, too bad. Uh, we can see that yields in Spain, Italy, and Portugal are high, and it's not surprising. As I said, budget reforms contributing to deep recession means deficits get bigger, at the same time the cuts get deeper. Is it any wonder bond investors are still worried they won't get repaid? The bailout funds are there, they're not enough. And if other countries get their back against the wall, why won't they do what Greece did? Let's restructure, let's re rewrite the rules. You take the losses. In fact, it seems the only time the bond markets have calmed down is when the ECB, the European Central Bank, does more LTRO, this long-term financing for three years, uh, even against bad collateral. That's when the markets have calmed down. But the sugar rush wears off, the bond market wants more, but you can't expect the ECB to keep coming up with more programs to buy ever more bonds. They probably can't boost their balance sheet to infinity. Has austerity gone beyond the point where it's effective? Is it getting in the way of more growth? Can Europe get out of this mess? These are my questions without some of the following. Debt restructuring, massive transfer payments, even some of the most indebted nations leaving the Eurozone. Could it be we're learning that an optimal currency zone is about more than productivity and interest rates, that to make it work you have to have shared socioeconomic values, that the strongest, most powerful nation, in this case Germany, can insist on running the tightest monetary and fiscal policy possible if it wants to make this work? Does Germany have to make compromises for the rest of Europe too? So many questions, I think my time's up, but we have a fabulous panel of economists to answer all this and more. Very good, thank you very much. So I think we'll start with Guillermo, the macro picture, and... Uh, Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jan. I'm delighted to participate in the launch of this uh, center, uh, something that SIPA uh, has been dreaming about for years, and 
very glad that they got somebody of your stature to be uh, leading us uh, going forward. Um, I don't have a lot of time, uh, uh, and I have some, some pictures that I, I want to show you, but let me give you the, the bottom line. I think we, uh, the uh, uh, discussion when, when the euro was established prior to that, uh, and uh, was and, and, uh, and the early stages of uh, after having been uh, established, uh, uh, expected that uh, this would uh, help eliminate some of the threats in, in the region, for example, competitive uh, devaluation among uh, European countries, facilitate trade, and uh, improve the capital market actually by uh, uh, allocating or reallocating funds uh, to uh, aims where the productivity of those funds was, was higher. Well, I think there was something missing, and now we are learning. Uh, we were, have been, among other things, printing fake money. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, overnight, a, a bank in Spain was printing uh, pesetas the day before, or peseta deposits, if you wish. The next day was printing euro, a reserve currency, with a lender of last resort. Well, that has to make a difference. Uh, an undergraduate eco economic student knows that if I do something like that, certainly something will happen uh, associated with that. And what we saw is what you would expect that to bring about, which was if funds going in the direction of the uh, pigs or the jeeps, how you want to call them. I like it, jeeps uh, better, and, and so on. So, uh, what I, uh, the, the first point that, that I would like to make is that when you look at things that way, all of a sudden, uh, this uh, development in Europe is not that different from the problem that we saw in emerging markets. Where there's a big flow of funds, something happened, the economy started to peg, for example, interest rates in the north uh, went down. So there was a flow of funds going in that direction that ended in tears in most cases. So here you have the first graph that I wanted to show you. These are the capital flows. Uh, this is a large sample of emerging markets. You see it going up, and something very interesting happens, which is that the flows go up in the run-up of the crisis. So it seems like everybody's blind. How could you be blind when there is a crisis coming? And this is not a special thing. It's not a curiosity. This comes from a sample, and it goes that way. Not only that, but you see the flows, both the capital inflow, money coming in, uh, and money coming out are increasing. So it is like you have created something that looks very much like money. If I divide Manhattan in two parts, and I see how the dollars are going one way or the other uh, with the taxes, you will see money going one way and the other way, and partly it's because you're talking about money. So we have created money, we have facilitated uh, these uh, transactions going on, and I don't think we, we understood uh, the phenomenon. When, when the crisis happened, you see both things going down. Let's go to the next uh, uh, picture. Uh, here, these are, these are flows within Europe. These are uh, portfolio flows. Uh, and you see something very interesting uh, that I learned uh, recently that uh, both, ha this is the, the starts at the, at the beginning of the Euro uh, period, and you see both increases. So both you have capital inflows and outflows going up, and, uh, and then when the crisis takes place, they shrink. So it is as if we have created a means of payment that uh, it reached a point where, for some reason, it uh, is not uh, longer acceptable, for example. So we created this area with uh, some money, which includes the, the, the cash, but also deposits, and then other, other in instruments. And all of a sudden, it's like a relapse. Uh, that's one way to think about it. It's kind of a, the system wants to relapse, for some reason, to the initial situation where you had the pesetas, where you had the drachmas, where you have uh, the liras, etc. So, and, and, and the issue is how you adjust to that. So that's why the ECB 
the European Central Bank can make a difference. Uh, but really, it has to be a lot of money. And it's been a lot of money. Is that enough? That's open to question. I don't want to get into that. Let me go to the third one. Uh, 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 OK, so here again, I'm looking at uh, Italy and Spain. And again, the same phenomenon as in emerging markets. This is the current account, which is the flip side of, of capital inflow. So you have the deficits getting worse as you go into the crisis, both in Italy and Spain. Again, as if people were blind. Well, you can be perfectly blind when money is, in, is, is a phenomenon. Because one thing is the fundamentals that the economies look at. And another thing is money. Money is destroyed. If all of a sudden somebody comes up and says, look, the dollar that you have in your pocket is only worth 50 cents. Well, I tell you, there's going to be a difference. It will be hard for you to pay the taxi when you go outside. Uh, so, and that's, those things can happen when you are <coughs> uh, letting those monies uh, circulate. Uh, and when push comes to shove, you have to have the lender of last resort. Otherwise, you have some kind of uh, uh, bank, bank run, which is my way of thinking about what's happening not only there, but in the world. <clears throat> and that's why, again, central banks have made a big difference. So where do we stand? I think we stand at the situation where at the mercy of the ECB, that's why everybody's looking at the ECB, and the ECB was doing something, but if, if it is only temporary, you don't solve this problem. So that's why the question is, will Draghi continue with this? Will they stop? Now Draghi said that he will stop, so that's why everybody's nervous once again. Uh, so small things like that are making a big difference because we are dealing with monetary or liquidity issues. Now, uh, one, the next one, uh, uh, no, the previous one, please. <clears throat> now I'm going to sort of switch gears, uh, still dealing with the same uh, phenomenon. This is a concept that has become popular rec recently, which is safe assets. You can think of them as liquid assets. And there is something extraordinary. There are some economies out there, uh, like Gorton, for example, at, uh, at uh, uh, Yale, that claims that you need this kind of assets in order for uh, the financial system to work. Because many of them, you need collateral, in other words. This is like the collateral that the financial system needs. If you destroy that collateral, then when people land, they have to know much more about you. If I have a li large house, and uh, I go to the bank and I show that I have a large, very valuable house. They give me money without asking me what I'm going to do with the money. So, and that facilitates the, the, the financial transaction. So if there is a sudden big destruction of, of, of that kind of liquidity or safe assets, that could cause big trouble. And this is a computation from Barclays. I cannot go into the details. But you see something extraordinarily happening extraordinary happen in, in 2008 which is a collapse of that, of the at tune of 30% of world GDP. That's very, very large. And it has not recovered. So I think we are in a situation where we, we, we were hit by, by bomb. We are doing all kinds of things in the US. We are able to do more than in Europe because we have a real union there. There they don't, but this is the background. This is there. We still live in a, in a world where the financial system is, is working, working on, on very uh, thin ice, so to say. Uh, and we have to be, and, and that's another reason why the markets are so nervous. So now, let me now just go to, to the last one, uh, which has to do with the impact, uh, the, one of the, I mean, the central questions that uh, uh, Jan asked is here is, will Europe derail the world economy? So, let me say something about the part of the world that I know a little better, which is Latin America. And it's very interesting that part of the world because it's been doing very well lately. So you wonder, oh, so if they're doing well, if there's a crisis like that, maybe they will be untouched. Answer, no. Actually, the country that got worse hit from a financial point of view in South America is Chile, which is open, which follows a very uh, conventional macroeconomic macroeconomic policy, most economists will say that this is a star performance, etc., etc., high credibility, very serious, etc. However, here, what you have here is the flow of domestic uh, credit, 
And you see uh, there are two lines, if you can see them. But the point is that it, you see it collapsing uh, uh, when <coughs> Lehman, Lehman happened. And it actually falls, those flows, by more than two standard deviations, actually close to three standard deviations, something that which is very unlikely for you to see. Uh, so, uh, and this is, this is Chile. How, how can this happen? Because Chile is an open economy and they have an open capital market. So when the, the liquidity crunch in the north hit the north, uh, since they have banks and, and, and corporations uh, which are linked to the rest of the world, everybody felt that and the banks got very scared and they stopped lending like everywhere else in the north. Uh, because they are interconnected, they are part of the, of, of the network. So, yes, if there is a derailment, and the derailment takes the form of, of a Lehman type, this was Lehman, Lehman type, that you have at, at least a momentary uh, interruption of, uh, of flows, that can have a very big impact uh, because, and with this I will end, uh, uh, Chile's output fell by 2%, the largest fall in South America uh, in 2009. So, so to, to, to end and, and, and sort of uh, wrap up, uh, I think uh, the reason why the situation is so unstable is because we have created liquidity, we need the, the central banks. I feel that Europe doesn't have a central bank like the United States, all the other issues that have been brought up, that you, Kathleen, have brought up, I think fall into place when you think about them. I guess my, my, the main, the, 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 the gist, the central message from what I'm saying is that these problems will not go away by fundamental reform. For example, stronger, uh, stronger uh, fiscal positions. Those are important. Undoubtedly. But the problems that we face now are more face problems of liquidity than uh, fiscal sustainability. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll turn to Mary Chano. Good morning. Uh, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here to celebrate uh, this launch of the Center for Global Economic Governance. I think it builds on so much of what we do at SIPA and Columbia, and it's a particular privilege and pleasure to have Jan Svenards, its founding director. Um, I think of myself as an economics-friendly trade and investment lawyer and an Asianist, so I must say I approach the subject of Europe uh, with uh, considerable humility. Uh, but there are perhaps two areas where I might offer a few uh, observations and questions. Uh, the first is exactly what Guillermo was speaking to, which is the interconnectedness of the global economy, and in particular, uh, how Europe can affect the rest of the world. And the second has to do with the state of international economic governance, uh, especially in monetary coordination and financial regulation. So first, on interconnectedness. Just prior to the financial crisis, there seemed to be a growing recognition of the importance of emerging markets as sources of global growth. You know, when I entered the workforce in the early 80s, we were in an 80-20 world, where 80% uh, of global growth was coming from advanced countries and about 20% from emerging countries. Now, by some measures, you know, we're closer to 65-35. And many are estimating uh, you know, a reversal of that uh, by 2030. And again, before the financial crisis, around 20, 2005 and 2007, I used to hear a lot of talk in Asia, uh, uh, I would say it was a lot of political talk, about economic decoupling, that somehow Asia was going to remain robust irrespective of what happened in the mature economies of the West. Well, the financial crisis showed that that was really wrong. And with a big drop in demand in the epicenter of the crisis economies, the United States uh, and Europe, you saw a huge drop in exports uh, from Japan and China. And China had the tools to address this uh, through credit expansion and stimulus measures. But I think in its aftermath, uh, perhaps influenced by the fragility of recovery in the United States and in Europe, China is very much stressing uh, the need uh, for more domestic demand-led growth and increased consumption. And this is reflected in its 12th five-year plan. Uh, 
But I think recognition of this direction is enormously important, uh, but it's not synonymous with implementation, and it's going to take many years uh, for this to come into uh, effect. So I don't think we should think for a minute that what happens in Europe isn't enormously important to the Chinese economy. The United States and Europe are nearly half of Chinese exports. Germany alone is China's sixth largest trading partner. And conversely, even a slight slowdown in China is of concern for Europe, as China is, lar is um, its largest export market and its second largest trading partner. So I think these examples really show how the world has changed. Uh, emerging markets are now the creditor nations. And never before have you had such a large emerging market, such as China, have such a global role. And I think on the positive side, this has helped keep the global economy going, as it used credit and stimulus to keep its economy going. And this has maintained an import pull from Europe and also from many other countries, uh, particularly commodity imports, where China is now the dominant uh, consumer. But on the negative side, we now have to worry about conditions uh, within China uh, because of its scale. So let me offer a few uh, observations on the second issue, which is what is the state of global economic governance? And are they sufficient? I think the answer is mostly yes uh, when it comes to international trade. But for finance and monetary coordination, the answer is no. In trade, we have meaningful and binding rules around international trade that have kept markets open, extended their benefits, and constrained protectionist impulses for the most part. But financial regulatory oversight and macro coordination at the international level, uh, particularly uh, when viewed in the context of the European situation, seems to be at an early stage and seems to be revealing a multi-layered problem. First, meaningful and established disciplines at the international level around macro coordination or financial regulatory reform are still at the very early stage and are underdeveloped. Countries seem to be willing to do more than they're willing to bind. So the answer isn't necessarily, in my view, to create new institutions or binding rules where the appetite for that at the global level seems very low. Uh, but the Eurozone itself is facing a structural architectural problem of the sort Guillermo also alluded to, but with a lot of institutions struggling and being forced to take on roles to try and help the situation. The IMF is attempting to help Europe by raising firewall funds, which I guess uh, are aimed at calming markets and potentially addressing collateral damage to other economies from problems emanating uh, from Europe and giving them perhaps a voice, uh, more of a voice in the European situation, although I frankly wonder if it's going to work that way. Um, the ECB has obviously taken unprecedented steps through its liquidity infusions. And in the last several years, we've seen ad hoc but very important processes developing around the G20 on macro dialogue, but I don't think it's lived up to its promise yet. And we've, of course, also seen the creation of the Financial Stability Board and the Basel III reforms, which are focusing on financial matters and which uh, have been attempting uh, to reduce risk and understand where risk uh, resides. But at the domestic level in Europe and in the United States, it would seem that a lot of the tools have been used or are severely uh, constrained. And what's particularly worrisome to me is that so much depends on a degree of political support to get through these difficult adjustments. And that political support in Europe appears to be eroding in some jurisdictions. So ultimately, as one European said to me the other day, what makes the situation in the Eurozone particularly challenging is that we are attempting to fix or redesign the car while we are driving it down the road. We may not have a choice, but it's incredibly difficult. I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll, turn, we'll turn to Sharon O'Halloran. 
Thank you. I also want to echo my uh, thanks to Jan for one, is setting this up and also for joining us. This is a global economic governance is an area that SEEP is very committed to and we are deeply invested in the success of this organization and yours, so thank you. And I'm going to address just a little bit of a more micro view and I'm going to look at the regulatory effects on deepening the European crisis, in particular the financial regulatory effects. And I think we can all agree, if you look at the first slide, so I'm going to have a lots of slides, so there we go. I think we can all agree that lax regulations allow the banks to become very interconnected and uh, huge and highly leveraged. And if you just look over here, as a percentage of GDP assets, banking assets, this consolidated banking assets, as a percent of GDP in the United Kingdom, it had risen to over 400%. And we also see that these banks, as you can see in the second slide, were highly leveraged. We're going to... Leveraged? Yeah, there we go. So they're highly leveraged. And again, this is just in the U UK, where the consolidating banking assets have reached over 50% on leverage. And this was also true for the United States. And we can see here, um, if you just look at your broker-dealers, you have uh, leverage ratios of about 50% as well within the investment banks as opposed to the commercial or large banks. Okay. And response to the crisis, the collapse of Lehman and so forth, what you had was an enormous amount of deleveraging that had to take place. And the nature of the deleveraging is shown here. That banks reduced their exposure predominantly by shedding bank assets, that is the toxic assets on their balance sheet. Okay, and in addition, the deleveraging that you saw right there after the Lehman, the 2008, was predominantly in the U.S., and it was very dramatic. And this weakened the U.S. economy, as well as the world economy. Now, this also created a lot of impulses to financial regulatory reform. And in the U.S., we saw this through the creation of the U.S., uh, the Dodd-Frank, legislation, which increased regulatory coverage on products such as derivatives and credit default swaps, as well as entities such as um, the investment banks and hedge funds that were deemed to be significantly important financial institutions. We also, as uh, Merritt mentioned, had the introduction of the Basel III requirements, and these included a set of capital requirements that forced banks to hold 4.5 of common equity, as well as 6% um, of the tier one capital of uh, weight, uh, risk weighted assets, as well as a leverage ratio, a minimum of 3% of uh, ratio of liquid assets to total ass assets, as well as liquidity requirements. And if we look at the response to the Basel regulations, you can see them here. And this is the um, European authority, the European Banking Authority, uh, and, uh, recapitalization plan. And this, what it, this shows here is that the European Banking um, Authority's recapitalization plan requires a capital ratio of 9%, that is, of capital to the risk-weighted assets. And the banks, and this is just lining up the large banks on that diagonal, have to move out of the gray area in, in implementing the Basel requirements. That is, they either have to raise more money, um, raise more capital, or reduce their outstanding loans, the risk-weighted risk assets. And what we're seeing from the data is the banks are doing more of A, raising money, than B, reducing the loans portfolios, but where they are cutting their loan portfolios, it's in the case for the non-bank lending. And you can just see this here. We go back to this picture and on the thing. The banks are actually responding by shedding uh, their portfolio on non-bank lending. That, and you can also see this is especially true in the U.S. and in European countries. And this is, has an estimated reduction in this quarter of about 221 billion euros. So reducing lending in the non-banking sector as a result of implementing the Basel requirements is exasperating in many regards the economic and fiscal crisis. And as was stated, you had the UK is now officially in a double recession. It's the first time since the 1970s. France is poised to elect their first socialist government since 1988. 
Uh, the Netherlands Prime Minister has just resigned because they wouldn't adopt austerity programs. And therefore, in many ways, we're going to need to find ways to help banks recapitalize without reducing lending to the real economy. And this may include other types of policies, such as government guarantees or expanding allowable uh, assets to meet credit requirements. Okay. So, Jeff, everything is up to you now. <laughs> <laughs> Let me uh, join everybody, first of all, in uh, saying how thrilled we are that you are here as our colleague. I, I could not be more thrilled. You heard the story of uh, um, Jan escaping from Czechoslovakia uh, and uh, going skiing uh, uh, in, uh, in the process. And uh, another person uh, um, close to me, my wife, escaped Czechoslovakia at about the same time. And we met Jan at, on the ski slopes uh, uh, at, at Cornell for the first time uh, many years ago. And he's a most remarkable person. And he is a perfect leader for this new center. And I could not be more thrilled. So this is just absolutely wonderful. I think I would uh, try to um, pull these strands together by making uh, the following uh, observation, and also to link in what Alan uh, Kruger was saying uh, just before the panel. The US and Europe are experiencing the same crisis. They should not be discussed separately. These are the same. And of course, the reactions uh, to this common crisis differ because Economies differ in their structure because policies uh, differ in response because institutions like the Fed and uh, the ECB have different mandates and have also taken different responses. But these are not distinct crises and the timing, of course, uh, emphasizes that. A lot of the uh, direct uh, pathways uh, are obviously causal from one uh, place to another such as uh, the uh, September 15 weekend in the United States in 2008 uh, dramatically intensifying the financial crisis in Europe. There are, in my view, short-term and long-term aspects of this crisis. I was very happy that Alan Kruger emphasized a lot of the structural features. I said to him afterwards that I did not think that those structural features really started with George W. Bush. I thought that they started around 1980, so I think that this is a deeper phenomenon of the North Atlantic coming to grips with the new global world economy, and especially with the rise of China, which I regard as the single most important economic event of our era. The short-term phenomenon is more financial, uh, and it was partly uh, a, an induced policy response to uh, the deeper structural problems, but it was the easy liquidity of the uh, 2000s up until 2008. And that was common to the US and to Europe. It was the same banks, uh, same capital markets, uh, whether it was the dollar or the euro. And we had bubbles uh, in a number of countries. And if the United States were separate countries, we wouldn't say it was one bubble. We would pick out different places where the housing bubble uh, occurred. In Europe, the housing bubble emerged in various places depending on national regulations and the accidents of geography. It isn't really Northern Europe and Southern Europe per se. Iceland was part of it. That, as far as I know, remains Northern Europe. Uh, it was Ireland, it was the UK, Spain, Portugal, uh, Greece, a uh, little bit different. Italy, uh, also a little bit different. Not Scandinavia, not Denmark, Norway, Sweden. They had their financial bubble 20 years earlier and uh, had, uh, didn't respond the same way this time. And it was German and French banks that played a huge role in this financing, but France and Germany did not have the same internal bubble. It was uh, French and German banks that provided the engine of the bubble in these other countries. So there was a long-term st structural challenge of 
meat and globalization, which already meant a lot of deindustrialization, a lot of attempt to make housing the substitute for the manufacturing sector, which is a, a doomed kind of strategy, a very naive, short-term uh, Keynesian strategy, not really reflecting structural needs. There was a financial bubble, and the financial bubble burst in 2008, and he who was exposed to these big inflows experienced the sharp outflows that we heard about, and the banks themselves uh, had to reverse significantly, and the extent of that reversal depended a lot on national policies. Here we bailed out the banks uh, to a significant extent, and the Fed provided $2 trillion of easy liquidity. In Europe, there was a German straitjacket on that kind of uh, direct bailout, and Europe suffered uh, German economic uh, thinking, which is uh, that there is no such thing as a lender of last resort, and that even financial problems are really fiscal problems, which is a big misunderstanding, or I don't know if it's a misunderstanding or just deliberate political economy. But Germany has refused to recognize the banking crisis and treated this as purely a fiscal crisis, which is factually wrong. And the ECB, partly because its mandate is not appropriate, and also because its policies under Trichet were even less appropriate, didn't respond to the crisis and basically allowed Europe to go into an amplification of the 2008 end of bubble rather than a solution to it. We don't have a solution here either. Everybody's struggling, so I don't want to exaggerate uh, the differences of Europe and the United States. Uh, but in the U.S., there was more of a bank bailout and more of a uh, Fed uh, liquidity ease. And in Europe, uh, until uh, Draghi came in, uh, the ECB was absolutely resistant to playing the most basic role that a central bank has to play. And until today, the German uh, monetary figures in the ECB and in Germany resist all of this. Uh, and could lead to the self-destruction of the euro because of this very weird macroeconomic misunderstanding. Um, so that's it. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's complicated because the details are complicated, but we have uh, a banking mess, which Sharon just described perfectly, uh, and uh, which uh, has the major problem that the way we do banking regulation is uh, pro-cyclical, not counter-cyclical, because as the capital base shrinks, the loans shrink even more. And in extreme cases, Greece has no banking sector anymore. So this is why Greece is in a complete collapse. There is no short-term lending in Greece uh, in, uh, through structured banking system anymore because the banking sector is bankrupt and there's no way to lend in Greece. And so there's a free fall. And this is treated as a fiscal problem, which is a, a big mistake. But there's a deeper uh, challenge, which is the, the thing that has gotten us into this uh, longer term mess is that we've not properly come to grips with globalization, which was really what Alan Kruger was uh, alluding to, the deeper changes in the North Atlantic is the rich world can't be the rich world anymore the same way it used to be when the manufacturing base has substantially shifted to another part of the world and competitiveness has shifted to another part of the world. And either we revamp, retool, restructure in a fundamental way or we have a series of bubbles. Those are our two choices right now. Fiscal policy can't save us, stimulus won't save us. This is all short-term gimmicks for politicians with very short-term horizons. We have an underlying real economic structural challenge. And I wanted to show uh, one uh, set of numbers. Within Europe, there is no single Europe. And it's quite interesting to understand, of course, there are the gypsies, uh, which I prefer uh, to the pigs, uh, as uh, countries that had a bubble and then had a subsequent uh, collapse. Uh, there's another part of Europe that interests me tremendously, 
uh, because it's the world's most successful little region uh, on many counts, and that's Scandinavia. Uh, we absolutely refuse to look at it in the United States at a political level because it's antithetical to everything we claim to believe uh, in American economy, that you need low taxes and, and uh, uh, and uh, cutting government spending and all the rest to balance budgets, make your economy competitive and all the rest. The top three countries, which, and you can't see the numbers in, in uh, this room, I know, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, are just the best on everything right now. That's the bottom line. And they have very low unemployment, they have no deficits, they have no net debt, to GNP, and they have almost no corruption according to the Transparency uh, International Index. They have no poverty. The uh, subjective well-being indicators show that they're the happiest places in the world. And the one thing that they do have, which we don't have, is they have ferociously high taxes. So they pay their bills. And their bills then pay for the education system, for science, for technology, for infrastructure. They actually live like a society rather than a group of individuals. And that, we are at the, we're on the bottom row. We're not the worst of it, but uh, we look pretty bad, by the way, uh, on this comparison list. We have high unemployment. We have massive budget deficits. We have huge uh, debt to, to GDP ratio, that not, though not as high as uh, Greece and uh, uh, basically uh, just after Italy. Uh, we have uh, very high corruption rates, though we don't, uh, uh, certainly we don't compare to uh, Italy, which was, this was recorded under Berlusconi. Uh, nobody compares to that. Um, and we have, and not to Greece, uh, we have a ferociously high poverty level, the highest in the high income world, because we don't uh, want to think about the poor in our country. Uh, and uh, we're not as unhappy as Spain and Greece, but we're not as happy as Scandinavia. But the one thing we definitely don't have is taxes in this country. Uh, our tax collection as a share of GDP is uh, 20 percentage points lower than the successful countries because we don't want to pay our way for anything. So this is my main concern with identifying the structural challenges. We need skills, we need education, but you can't get that for 0.1 of 1% of GDP or announcing tiny programs. Uh, the way that Scandinavia does it is that they treat the whole society as part of society to make sure that everybody has a foothold and a chance. We have left the bottom two thirds of society blow off and we now have one in every two households in this country in a low income status, which is still not part of the American understanding, but we are half a low income society. That means within twice the poverty line. So Europe should teach us another real lesson about structure. And structure is either we can decide to be a country of individuals with the highest inequality, the highest poverty rates, half the kids not being able to go to school. I know a lot of those societies around the world, they're Guillermo's region traditionally, but now Latin America is becoming more equal and the United States is becoming less equal. Or we could decide to be like a society where we actually invest in the structural change, the skill upgrading, the infrastructure, the modernization, and we recognize that half our country is not part of it right now, and then our indicators would start to improve. Thanks. Can I just do a quick follow-up? And that was you. For everybody, actually. Great um, For you, Jeff, and again, everybody else, please feel free to jump in on the panel. It seems to me also, but you tell me, because I'm not a great student of the Scandinavian countries, although I'm a quarter Swedish. There you go. Half Irish as well, so. <laughs> um, don't they also have a more, when I mean, you compare those countries to the United States, we are a nation of immigrants. We've had wave after wave of people that we are trying to assimilate from countries around the world, cultures around the world. Don't they have less immigration? Aren't they partly societies because 
They are, because they have common culture, because they are not buffeted by these things. And it's interesting that you lift, leave out of that list China, considered the roaring giant of Asia, if I, I bet if we put their uh, poverty rate up on the, on the board, they wouldn't look so hot either. Well, but yeah, but China is a middle income developing country. I'm trying to show what's happening with high income countries. Uh, yes, of course, they're, they're more of a society because they're more homogeneous. And I'm saying we're suffering from not taking our diversity more seriously. Diversity isn't a license to ignore other people or to say that we don't care about others or to say that we're not going to have a society. And that, to my mind, is where we stand right now. We've become nastier and nastier, and the political rhetoric is the worst that it's been in, in half a century. It's unbelievable where we are right now. The Republican platform is to cut food stamps, to cut education. Mitt Romney seemingly said in an uh, overheard remark that he wants to eliminate the Department of Education or at least slash it. That's a great response to a structural challenge. I think that you're absolutely right in the sociological diagnosis, but in the economics, we'll be devastated by that. So I'm making an economic point. And one can understand how the traditions of Scandinavia are different, but if we let ourselves come to believe that we have absolutely no society here, just a bunch of individuals, which is the prevailing literal philosophy now of a large part of our political discourse, we're finished as a country because we will not hold these things together. That's my, that's my feeling. That, and so we need to learn from these countries that are doing it better and ask how they're doing it better and say, yeah, they're, you know, they, they treat each other more like part of the same group, and maybe we should also. I guess that's also one of the things troubling the Eurozone. Uh, to a financial question, because uh, you touched on the liquidity, Sharon, you touched on, uh, you know, very, in great detail on uh, what's happening at banks. A real basic question, and, and Jeff, I think you, interesting how you talked about we've got a banking crisis, not a fiscal crisis, yes. and Europe doesn't really recognize it, and they won't. Should the uh, Basel III requirements be postponed? Here we are, you know, banks have to deleverage, they're supposed to lend, we've already gone through the crisis, they're not gonna lever up again immediately, right? Is this something that, at least, because I'm not worried, you're talking this fundamental thing, in the short term though, well, we have to weather this and get on the road to the long-term solutions, is that one of the steps that should be taken? You, again, there are ways in which you can do that without, um, undermining the whole Basel framework or even the timetables. Again, one of the recommendations was to broaden what could be considered as tier one capital, that is what the assets that you'll allow to be um, credited against. So that's one way to broaden or loosen the requirements without undermining it. And that's what people worry about, that if they say postpone it, it will never go into place or they completely revamp some of these definitions that will never go into place. And so that's one way that might be, at least in the short to intermediate term, allow you to facilitate the uh, credit to the, the, um, the private sector and lending. And the other way is through loan guarantees of interbank lending. That was a successful program that we had in the United States. And while it did expose the U.S. to significant, the government to risk, there was no significant losses on there. And that will then would reduce the risk, the risk weighted um, assets, which then would allow them to increase um, assets to the again the real economy and to the, the productive sector. So those are ways in which they can actually facilitate within the Basel III context that would not undermine it. What about public provision of capital? Um, that is a very uh, that's a difficult one right now, I'm thinking in Europe, to get through, especially with the German, in the German context and with the concerns right now in the fiscal aspects. So this is some of the ways that I think could probably facilitate increased liquidity without fully going to public provision, although I think it, that's something that should be on the table. But isn't that really where they're so stuck, which is the banking sector can't lend Europe is collapsing from a credit squeeze, yes. not from a aggregate demand, not from a competitiveness squeeze. It's collapsing because their banking services it's, aren't being provided, exactly. and so they have to be turned back on again. Exactly. And so these are some ways to do it. 
the large interjections into, of capital into the banks is another way, that is a way that we actually pursued. Um, and I'm just thinking the political landscape, those may be more palatable at this point, but I do believe that should be on the table. Basel III. You know, I think countries are responding in heterogeneous ways to Basel III. So some are, are, are adopting more stringent standards even than Basel III. China, for example, has identified itself as doing so. I think Switzerland uh, has also done so. I think most U.S. money center banks claim they can meet Basel III. So the question really is a European uh, question. But we should also look at what Basel III's unintended consequences are. And uh, I guess one of the areas where I've been concerned is in the area of trade finance and the consequences of the risk weights uh, are uh, assigning risk to trade finance uh, that most think are not there. And as a consequence, we're already seeing European banks exiting from trade finance, and happily we have uh, Asian and other uh, financial institutions who are stepping into the void uh, uh, to take care of the problem. We didn't see that happening after the great financial uh, crisis requiring international institutions to come in. So I think this is an unintended consequence, but I think Basel III probably has a lot of examples like that. They decided concretely not, not to take off the trade finance, which I thought would have been a very reasonable thing for them to have done. But this is a place where the insurance companies can actually play an effective role, and they've actually been very much outside of the discussion by ensuring um, that type of financial structures. And so we haven't really looked at the full panoply of actors and policies that we can facilitate liquidity. I just wonder if anybody has any uh, thoughts about the political economy of, of uh, German perspectives on this, uh, and in particular the role of German banks in German politics, because there has been, as far as I can see, zero public recognition of, uh, about the German banking system and its role in this crisis. Yes. A great book written by, if I could pump up my own company, uh, a Bloomberg News reporter, Yaman Onoren. He wrote a book called Zombie Banks. There's a great section of the book, a big chunk of it, about the Landesbank. And oh my gosh, if you think we have uh, influence of the banks in our system, the Germans haven't put much focus on that. But it, when you read Yaman's account, it's amazing how intertwined and how much the potential losses at the Landesbank have, have figured into the last two years what the Germans were and weren't willing to do. That's yeah, interesting because they, the, they were the banks of last resort to buy the toxic assets from Wall Street in the last two years. Uh, that so out really well. that, that, uh, <laughs> it did work out well. To be bailed out or help significantly yeah. to be even where they are today. Right. I'd like to ask Jan and uh, Guillermo and, and everybody, but you know, Jan, you do come from this very rich background and uh, you've consulted all over the world. You speak Spanish fluently. <laughs> you, and you went in the, the early 90s, you, were, you helped in Poland. You were called over to help them set up a market economy after the wall came down. Is that correct? Okay. I work, Jeff, Jeff worked there. Okay, so the two of you, there you go. But in terms of lessons from the past, right, what are the, are there parallels? Are there things that were done wrong? Because you were talking, Jeff, about how, oh, how fractured we are, and it's true, and we don't want to do this, we don't want to do that, and we look at Scandinavia. Well, the, the uh, you know, Eastern Europe has certainly had its share of conflict and fracturing, you know, in the last couple of decades. So when you look at where they were, where they got to the crisis they dealt with, do you see lessons or issues that could apply now? Yeah, I think, I think the big lesson from that part of the world is that uh, it can be very painful to go through a major structural adjustment, and those countries have gone through a wrenching uh, adjustment in the 1990s, uh, really greater than the Great Depression of the 1930s in terms of uh, some of the adjustment, complete reorientation. Uh, in many respects, shifting trade from east to west, uh, retooling, closing down a lot of startups, new companies. So I think it's the internal adjustment, which is the example that these countries have given. Now, the question is whether politically this is acceptable in the Western world. I think taking a grandiose picture, uh, 
advanced civilizations are not very good at uh, taking pay painful measures and, uh, and uh, adjusting to the rise of new civilizations. And in some sense, that's what Jeff was pointing out to and everybody else as well. I mean, this is a decades-long uh, adjustment that we have in the West, and we're just partially through it. Some countries have done a you know, big step. The Central East European countries have obviously done it. Germany has changed dramatically compared to what one expected. I mean, we always thought the German labor markets would remain inflexible and so on, and uh, the Hartz one through Hartz four reforms actually managed to do significant adjustments towards flexibility. The northern countries that Jeff mentioned have, have done that as well. So it's possible. I think in the end it boils down to what uh, I think a number of panelists here said it was, it's a political question. You know, how much of a hardship are we willing to take? And I would say the governments actually now have the knowledge. It's not like they don't. It's a question of uh, how much one is willing to take and how fast. I want to get some audience questions, but Guillermo, I want you to weigh in on that, the lessons and parallels of Latin America. It's something that probably uh, traddles uh, both uh, comments uh, before. Uh, and that is the importance of, of the credit market. I mean, if there is something one learns from these experiences is that if you stop credit, then you have, you make a big damage to the economy. Even when you have a lender of last resort. Because one of the interesting things that I find in the Lehman episode is that uh, it, it appears to be a result of the central bank saying, up to here, we won't bail out anybody. Then. The next day, they went back and bailed out everybody, and still output fell. So that's some very, very interesting episode. Uh, and I think the part of the problem is that we have designed the lenders of last resort to keep the financial system afloat, but not necessarily take the next step and, and lend. So, in Europe, I see the some of the discussion, especially coming from, from Germany, they want to make sure that the banks stay in place. Uh, they want to, I mean, uh, Basel III or whatever that uh, recapitalizes banks seems like a great idea if that's what you have in mind. But without credit, the economy don't work. We, we have learned that, and I must tell you, economists, macroeconomists have, have to relearn that because the models that they use is the representative individuals where there is no credit. So they miss it completely. 